Sandy Johnson. Oh. Great to have you over here in sunny Pollock. Nice to be uh, here. In case I forget to tell you, this is where the walking football takes place primarily that you've been putting off for the last year or so to what, get involved what's in. walking football? Yeah. Okay, we're going to have a lot of problems <laughs> in this interview. But seriously, this is, and there's one right next to you at Scotstown as well uh -huh. that you could be participating in. I'm committed to 2022 being my year of walking football. <laughs> my goal was to score one goal. I don't see a problem there. In the warm-up. Oh, you haven't seen me play yet. <laughs> Good, Sandy. Thanks for coming over. Uh, to what we're doing here, uh, obviously, is creating um, a, a magazine, if you like, on behalf of Ringwood Publishing. Uh, which is your company? You started it how long ago? Uh, 1997. Wow, 25 years. Yep. Big anniversary this year. What are we uh, doing? Going to sleep for a week. <laughs> no party at your place? No uh, party. No. No. no, we'll have one anyway without you. Be better. <laughs> Let me take you back then. Before Ringwood, what was your background, Sandy? <sighs> My professional background uh, is in social work, um, okay. but I mean, all, all my life I've had two main obsessions, football and politics, um, but I wasn't good enough to make football uh, a living, and I was too good to make politics a living. <laughs> um, <laughs> too honest. <laughs> so I uh, decided to settle for, uh, as all social workers say when they ask why in social work, to help people, um, uh -huh. but it seemed an appropriate way to help people, so I was in social work for about 40 years. Okay, so you were getting the hang of it? Just about, then it's time to give up. So does that overlap with Ringwood then? Were you a, an author? Uh, for, for, for a while, I um, for many years I was uh, Assistant Director Child Care in Strathclyde Region. Um, which meant a responsibility for childcare matters, as everybody in Strathclyde loved to point out to people was half of Scotland. Um, yeah, yeah. population-wise, yes. I stopped uh, that um, and um, formed an organisation, including to support uh, young people in, in severe uh, trouble and okay. uh, I was chief executive of that, but I finally... So that was a private company? Uh, uh, yeah, working alongside the authorities? Works with the local authorities. Providing a service. Scottish yeah. government. Uh, okay, my brother did something similar with foster caring down south. He started yeah. a, a company. So that's uh, the, the chunk of your life then has been, spelt, it has been spent in, in the caring side? Aye, uh, although when, it, when I stopped in 2007, I vowed I wouldn't uh, have any more to do with it other than keeping a, uh, an eye on what was happening. Um, I think you need to do that, Sandy, a clean break. A clean break I have that kind of conversation with people through the walking football all the time, who were maybe teachers or, or whatever, and they always get approached to go and help with this or help with that or do a wee project, mm -hmm. and that's the temptation. And then they get sucked back in and end up still working in their, their 70s and, and it, onwards. It, it's financially difficult. I mean, I could have made a good living as a, a child consultant. care consultant, mm -hmm. but uh, I decided a clean break and focus on other things, particularly publishing and uh, writing. Okay, and this year is the 25th anniversary of Ringwood. Yes. Where did Ringwood spring from then? Because you started it, yes? Yes. Um, a small group of uh, myself and, and friends um, in the late 90s became increasingly aware of how difficult, if not impossible, it was for our, um, uh, new unknown writers to get their work published, no matter how good that work was. Um, and when is that because of the process, because yeah. of the submissions and, and the clique that is the publishing industry? No, it's, it's because of a major structural change in the, in the publishing industry. For the whole of the 20th century, right up till um, about 1979, all publishers, whether they were small, medium or, or very large, used their successful books um, to subsidise or allow them to print books they knew wouldn't be successful, but which they knew they had literary merit. Okay. And one of the, 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 the 
the historical things in that era that was never widely known. Most of what people would call contemporary fiction um, and literary fiction never sold greatly. They would appear in paper in the hardback and they'd be lucky if they would sell a hundred books. Even right. so-called famous authors with literary reputations would sell very few of these books, but the publishers um, were prepared to subsidise that and the authors, they didn't get a lot of money, but they got, um, they got credibility and uh, a reputation as a novelist. But um, and, uh, uh, try and avoid the trap of blaming Margaret Thatcher for everything, but one of the things that you just have <laughs> but almost anything. which is fair one of the, the things that was part of her economic revolution in Britain and to be fair to her on a, on a global scale as neoliberalism came in is that um, even big publishers all got bought over by corporates who were looking for a bit of um, artistic or cultural credibility um, okay. and they bought them up and absorbed them and uh, the bigger publishers bought smaller publishers um, but what happened there it, it quickly became run by the um, bean counters and accountants mm -hmm. and they said why on earth should we publish uh, books that we know aren't going to make any money Mm -hmm. And if you're an accountant or a bean counter, that that's makes all sense. that matters. That's, that's the bottom that. line, regardless so of what are Almost merit. overnight, publishers stopped um, publishing uh, books of literary merit that weren't going to be bestsellers. And you, you ended up in the ludicrous situation where, where most publishers these days would rather publish dross written by a celebrity with a big name yep. that they know will sell, rather than sell a book of outstanding literary merit by Joe Bloggs who nobody's heard of and nobody will buy. And that's the same in every industry, isn't it? The film industry, music industry, everywhere. It's mm -hmm. all the pennies that, that count. So even although you'd spent a 40-year career in a caring market, you were still the same when you came into publishing because the ethos behind it was to help the wee guy, to help the unpublished, yep. to tell the stories that were never going to be told. Yep. Um, and so what, what are the criteria for it? In those days, 25 years ago, what was your, your mission statement, if you like, or your criteria for publishing a book? That we would concentrate only on unpublished uh, Scottish writers who were producing work of merit. Right. Um, it, and they had to, as an author, they had to have a Scottish connection. They didn't necessarily need to be Scots, uh, but they had to have a Scottish connection. And in terms of, of the topics, we tried to restrict it to, to um, themes that were of particular interest to, to, to me and, and the group of friends. Politics, religion, football, human relationships, alcohol, sex, crime, violence, relationships, which almost covers everything. Most of my life anyway. <laughs> <laughs> just the edited highlights. Yeah. Um, so th 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 that was the criteria for authors previously unpublished. Um, that's where the themes and the work had to have merit and appeal to us. We knew these books would not make money. We knew Ringwood would never make money um, and would never be grow as a, as a publisher. Um, so the objective has never been to make it into a, a multi... No. million pound no. industry, uh, uh, business it, it was is it a charity <laughs> there's a hackneyed story I keep telling about that which uh, too uh, long the, the quick version for you um, basically um, we knew we wouldn't make money um, we couldn't even pay the key people there were three of us committed ourselves to doing the bulk of the work but without pay Okay. And um, there was another group, the rest of the collective, by then the collective had turned into Rigman Publishing. Um, at that time they weren't a limited company, but that came later. Um, but we, we knew that the company wouldn't make money and the company wouldn't grow. Um, we didn't expect to make money out of the books we would be publishing, but we did want not to make a loss because okay. we had to subsidise yeah. the loss but we Ringwood is, is never 
as people sometimes think, a not-for-profit organisation, which is a technical term with some... That's a formal business term, yeah. yeah. But we are simply an organisation that doesn't make a profit. Okay. Which is slightly different. Mm -hmm. but, um, so you're rubbish. <laughs> if, if you're a bean counter... Depending on, yes, yes, we, we depending are, on what your objectives rubbish. are in the but first place. We always knew that we need, we would get the money for, you know how we started, we got the money for the first book and we had a business model that the f first book would generate enough money to allow us to publish the second book. And it would be self-perpetuating. So unlike most publishers who have a, a, a stream of books that they know they're going to publish, we, we were doing one book at a time and living okay. from one book to the next. And any money we got from one book would be reinvested in future books. So okay, there was, I understand. Uh, although we have shareholders who've never paid a dividend, they're not in it to get uh, their money back. They're in it to uh, do some cultural good. Okay. So how many books have Ringwood published in that 25 years, Sandy? We, we, we started with a flurry of, of uh, a couple of books which sold quite well um, and we actually sold the, the film option rights to one of the first two. But then we went into hibernation for um, about 10 years as the main three people finished off their careers because it proved okay. too much Time consuming. Do, doing a yeah. full-time job. It's a, and been a full-time publisher. Uh, but we reactivated it in 2011, and since then we've published around 60, 60 books. Right, 60 titles. Right. Excellent. Can you tell me them all? Yeah, I will in a minute. <laughs> I was scared you were going to answer me there. Sandy, right from the start then, now I understand where Ringwood was coming from and what the ethos was behind it. You've had this model that you perpetuate, an intern model, where you, you, well, you tell me how the intern yeah. model works. It's, it, it's interesting, it's, it's, as far as I'm aware, we're, we're the only, we're certainly the only publisher in Scotland, and I suspect we're the only publisher in Britain that um, is so reliant on an intern model. And basically, that's because when we started uh, the, the, the model I told you about before, the, the three dedicated, almost full time but unpaid staff did almost everything with some voluntary help from the other members of the original yeah, collective. Authors themselves. Right. But um, that proved, w with that smaller staff base, you, you could literally only cope with one book at a time, uh, and it was literally finish one, start another. Uh, Which I, is a process. How long is that process then to give people an idea yeah, of uh, it's the one advantage of being a small publisher is that you, you can have a much quicker uh, start to finish program. For example, one of the books that we, that, that we approved in December for publication, if it had been uh, with a bigger publisher, you would expect to be published in late 2023. We're right. going to be publishing that book before June of this year. We do, okay. we can do so it. So six months is the shortened version six, of six that months process. Is, is, yeah. is now the normal. But as as good quality submissions, as you know, are the life um, of publishers. Mm -hmm. What comes in the it's door. Start of the dictates. conveyor belt. Yes. But what we were finding was that there were more than four books a year coming to us that absolutely deserved to be published. Okay. But the three of us, full time, unpaid, couldn't, couldn't do, do more than four. So we started by taking on young people who were committed uh, to a career in publishing. But the, the other side of uh, the, the publishing reality is that publishing jobs are in very high demand. Even small publishers um, for basic entry-level posts uh, are getting two, three hundred applications. For every post. For every post. So your chances of getting in are nil. And in less in the old bit, you know someone in, that, yeah. In Oxford yeah. days, English southeast, it's all who you know yes. rather than how you get in. But um, for same as prime minister, really, it helps. It certainly helps, and look how well that model's working for the <laughs> council. Um, but we 
discovered there was a lot of young people out there who, in order to, to break, the, the, there's, there was a vicious circle. Publishers had so many applicants that they could afford only to select applicants that had already proved they could do the job. Right. So you go to the vicious circle, you needed the relevant experience to get a job. Yeah. You couldn't get relevant experience without a job. But they broke, we have offered to break that cycle by giving our interns relevant experience across the whole range of professional tasks from uh, assessing critically the manuscripts as they come in through the editing, the proofreading, the copy editing, the uh, cover design, uh, launching the book, marketing. promoting and marketing. So they get experience across the And I would range. go a step back from that as well because I know that the reason you and I met was uh, through my friend Magnus Moetta, who sadly passed, and you were doing a book with him, but you sent someone out to sit with him and go straight the book with him. So even yeah. before the submission stage, you can help somebody tell the story who might not have the tools to tell it themselves. Yep, we, we involve um, the interns in... I mean, that, that was a particularly gross example of editorial control when you were ghostwriting it but normally we, yeah. we assist the authors through the uh, the editing process but our interns work at a, 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 or rather they, they start from scratch but they develop skills across the whole range of things quite mm -hmm. a high level mm -hmm. skill and it quickly became you you mentioned a mission statement we quickly added to the publishing um, unpublished Scottish writers of, of merit a second mission statement which was to help um, young Scots committed to making a career in publishing get the experience that would enable them to get jobs in publishing yeah. and we're, we're, we're very proud now of um, the number of our interns and it's it's in almost treble figures over the, uh, yeah. The ten years now, who've left Ringwood and, and managed to get a job in publishing, which they almost all acknowledge they wouldn't have got an interview for far less the job. Yeah, um, and those skills that, that they're learning and developing with Ringwood, they're so transferable now, Sandy, because of the internet and because of the global market that we can tap yeah. into. Because publishing now, you, I dare say, you're not just talking and and take sales and marketing as part of that. That covers every product under the sun. So it's invaluable skills yeah. that these yeah. interns are, are, are getting. Yeah. And the, I mean, some of our interns come and they're clearly committed to a career in publishing and that's what they want to do. Others come because they think they might be interested yeah. in publishing. But you, your point is that most of our interns end up in a career that isn't publishing but um, is related to publishing using yes. the skills they've developed yeah. their public because relations. Because under that term, publishing comes so much. Yeah. It's such an umbrella yeah. for so many different, apart from just people skills mm -hmm. on their own. So, so, I mean, the most um, surreal example is that, um, and this has happened to more than one intern, one day they're working for Ringwood, one of the smallest publishers in the world, far less Scotland. Yeah. The next week, they're working for Harper Collins, one of the top five publishers in the world, getting paid a whole lot of money for doing less than the work than they were doing the ring. It, right. it's now, I know that you don't pay the interns. Do you take a commission from them once they get into employment? Do you take a percentage of their wages? We would be able to pay a salary to the, the gang of three if we had done that, but no, no. no. Um, we, That's maybe something to think about for the interim well, contract. No, I think we're so guilty um, because it is... It, it, I mean, I, in, in my early career, I was a trade union lay official senior one with uh, National Union of Public Employees. And if you told me 40 years ago I would spend my declining <laughs> years ruthlessly exploiting as many young people as I could for as long as I could and not paying them a penny, yeah. I would have hit you, at least yeah. with a rip for slander. Um, but that is the reality of my life. But yeah. I sleep at night soundly because yeah. we do deliver on the deal we guarantee interns. They give us their time and effort and commitment yeah. 
and we provide them with the, equip them with the skills and experience that will make them competitive in the market. Yeah. So, and there's a bit of this that, that uh, it's hard to convey, or it's hard when you first think about it, the, the exploitation of that market. But people must think that to manage people who are not being paid must be easy peasy. But I can turn that on its head very, very simply because they walk away at the drop of a hat. And you have no recourse with an intern to say, wait a minute, you need to do that by... Yeah. If you're paying somebody a wage, you can demand mm -hmm. certain things. But I know how difficult it is from personal experience mm -hmm. to juggle that internship. Let me take you on a wee bit from that then, from the interns, because it's a lovely model and I'm sure we'll come back to it. In fact, I plan to speak to some of the interns over the coming weeks and learn about the different aspects from their angle uh, and, and the, the experience and skills that they're gaining. Let's have a wee think about the books then over the years. And You said 60 books in the last 10 or 11 years, Sandy. Can you give me some highlights out of that? <laughs> books that we shouldn't miss, yeah. that should be on our bookshelves. That, that, that's a, a bit like asking a parent to tell you who's their favourite child. Well, apart from the 10% then. They take <laughs> the 10% no, out of it. Uh, but other authors will watch this, so I, I, I can't directly careful. answer that question. But I, I, I do want to give you an answer related to books, related to the Ringwood themes. and um, Okay, well, the, let's start with memoirs then, since mine is a memoir. Yeah. Okay, um, <sighs> memoirs are, 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 are fascinating, and, and we offer a different range of books with memoirs. But w one is called Memoirs of a Feminist Mother by Carol Fox, um, yep. and it, it's about a, a single um, person uh, without a partner wanting uh, to have a baby through IVF. Okay. And in the Scotland of the 20th century, that was a oh. horrendous notion, bitterly opposed by the whole Scottish yeah. medical press. But her, her book is the story of how she fought against system. all that mm -hmm. prejudice, the systems and everything, and she set a world record of 29 attempts at IVF before she became oh. pregnant. But she became pregnant, and she's now, and our cover is amazing of that book. There's her as a, a proud young mother holding the baby, and in the back cover, there's her now as a successful woman and her daughter is a up highly yeah. grown-up person. Um, uh, we, we've got a very interesting book called Stirring the Dust by Mary McCabe, which is about three, four generations of, of family. Um, we've got um, a book by uh, John Keeman, in the shadow, in the of, the shadow crane, of the crane, and the yeah. crane is the Finiston crane, and that, that that's a fabulous book. It's about a Glasgow that's disappeared, the yeah. Finiston Anderson, yeah. and it's about John's own fight growing up with the welfare state, and then the attacks in the welfare state. So it's both social and political. But you'll notice I'm saving the best one. Till, I did. Yes, I know. I was hoping the the ten percent, um, <laughs> which uh, I just. I'm sure you're aware you wrote yourself. <laughs> um, but uh, is that the one? That's the <laughs> very one. A wonderful book, and I, I, I can share with a wider audience. Over the last two years, that's been Ringwood's best-selling book. Um, okay, so you've had a bad two years. A really bad two years. <laughs> We've had a superb two years, largely because the author has uh, endorsed the the principle. Uh, decision we now ask of all authors if you're with Ringwood getting your book published doesn't mean you sit back and put your feet up it means you have to go out there and do the primary work of selling and marketing your book and you have understood that and delivered in that uh, better than any of our other authors uh, which is why your book has been so successful no 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 it's because it's so good it's what the mouth, it's what the mouth is, can it? But, <laughs> but, but if you want to just rely on sales, then you would have to accept that all these celebrities who sell millions have got great books, they haven't. Their yes. books are dross. Yes. Sales are not a measure of quality. That's for sure. That's for sure. It's the marketing, especially with yeah. books, because until you've got it in your hand and started reading it, you don't really know what you've got in your hands. You understand? Yep. And you can make up, I see on Amazon all the time, the people who know the tricks to make books into bestsellers and make them into this and that by getting them into this list and onto that list and 
and it's really a marketing trick that's really the, the ploy so what other genres then of books what would your highlights be for instance crime writing crime writing we've um, we've just had Leela Soma interviewed recently yes uh, with her mother at the Mela we, we um, be, being a Glasgow publisher uh, are, are quite proud of our Glasgow crime writers because um, Unlike many crime writers, they actually know what they're talking about. Um, <laughs> one of them, Alan Nicholl, uh, had yes. a long and successful career as a procurator fiscal. Another, Charlie Sharkey, clutching at straws, had a, a very successful, it still has a. And he was a liar, wasn't he? I mean, a lawyer. lawyer criminal lawyer. Um, we, we've got a crime book about a Glasgow based um, serial killing. Harold Shipman type, written by a GP, and we've got a fascinating book, Leila's book, um, about uh, police, race relations, and uh, the interconnections between all that and the city of Glasgow. Four writers, four crime books who know what they're talking about. And I'm hoping that we can feature most of these books as we go on, Sandy, if not yeah. all, if they're still available. We, what, what, what's interesting is that you started off with quite a narrow thought of what Ring would, the subjects that Ring would, 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 uh, would bring on board. It seems to be a lot broader now. Yeah. Almost all jo genres now. Uh, well, um, certainly, I, I mean, I was resistant for the. And, you bring your personal prejudices to it. I was resistant about science fiction, then, mm -hmm. but we, um, for the first time last year, we published a science fiction book that is full of, con Saved from the Fire by Mark Gallagher, full of contemporary themes like um, authoritarian governments, populism, book burning, censorship, climate, the effects, the disastrous effects on worlds of climate change. It, it's a very contemporary book, and I realised it was silly not to, uh, not to embrace that. That's just one example of how uh, our criteria changed. It would be a shame to have you here and not talk about any of your books, Sandy. How many books have you published? Uh, six. Um, and you've just republished one of them, relaunched. Aye, aye. Um, the, the the very first one I published. Uh, wasn't a Ringwood book. Um, it was by Mainstream Press and it was about Graham Soonis. But you will appreciate that it, it's more about politics than football. Okay. It's basic... Um, because you're not a Rangers man by any stretch of the imagination. Well, uh, I, I, I mean, I published the, the, the Graham Soonis book and everybody assumes the Rangers support. Then I published a book about Celtic supporters and everything as soon as Celtic supporters but as, as you know we're never truth, constantly the sad truth me. are we going to go down this road are we and I'm mention them I'm afraid I'm a Clyde supporter I've got the scars well, at least you've just got the sympathy of everyone that watches <laughs> this anyway if nothing else when I was a young boy which is many years ago um, Clyde twice won the, the Scottish Cup uh, and I thought this is what the world is about being a football supporter you have Team wins the Scottish Cup four <laughs> twice in four years. Yeah, and um, they've never won anything. anything Glasgow Cup, maybe then. Glasgow Cup, the old Glasgow Cup, maybe. Uh, the twice, twice we did. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> well, I've got sad. good news for you. It's actually really, really bad news because you've been promising to come to Walking Football now for about eighteen months, and you've always had excuse after the excuse, and you're going to get yourself fit enough to come to Walking Football which is completely turning the whole thing on its head because the reason people come along is to get a bit fitter. But we've got a new session starting on Thursday mornings at uh, Tory Glen well, Football Centre mm -hmm. and it's going to be run by the Clyde Community Trust. That's who's starting the session. So if I can't entice you along to that, I'm really struggling. Well, I, th I think that might be the tipping point that I need to Hopefully. You, I you keep can, trying anyway. I you keep can plugging fill away. In the details. Okay. I need to teach you the rules as well, because mm. as a Clyde supporter, you're probably not that familiar with the way <laughs> football's played anyway. <laughs> and your Spanish team, of course. Villarreal. Yeah, that's a bit more like it. Aye. Uh, uh, Do you ever go to see them, Sandy? Aye. I, I, I lived in Spain for several years. Uh, 
to write the book about Villarreal and also to write the book about the uh, the relationship between Celtic supporters uh, and, and Villarreal yes. yeah. and the, the yeah. world. Um, and that book was about putting forward a better model of football relationships, not based as most of, of Scottish football is on sectarianism, bigotry and hatred, but mm -hmm. um, the Villarreal Celtic supporters called the Celtic Submarine have a model of um, based on respect and love. They don't quite revolutionary in football teams. Uh, they learned from the Celtic supporters that uh, arrived 10,000 or a town of 40,000, yeah. which is not in the tourist trail, never had a visitor in its life. Uh, they were drawn against Celtic in their first return to Spain after Seville. 10,000 turned up. They were terrified, the yeah. 40,000. They had a picture of 10,000 English football hooligans destroying their town. Yeah. What happened was They'd they be were boarded up. They were blown away by the kindness, the generosity, the warm-heartedness, the, the good spirit, yeah. the humour, yeah. everything good about uh, Celtic supporters abroad. Scottish people, I would suggest. Yeah. Well, uh, I, it did make me quite a few enemies when I, when I pointed out that the, the pattern of behaviour of Celtic supporters abroad was different from the pattern of behaviour of uh, Rangers Army, supporters. Tartan Army, for instance. No, Tartan Army is good, but Rangers supporters. Um, and the Villarreal example was there. In 2004, Celtic supporters came and captivated the town. 2006, Rangers supporters came and attacked the Villarreal team bus. Right. Um, but, That's uh, because of the connection with that other. <laughs> but uh, I mean, it's 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 not as simple as Celtic sport as no, good Rangers no, it's sport as bad. Because the Tottenham Army is made up of both, of course. Yeah, and uh, I, <clears throat> my that that book, the Celtic Submarine, um, had a message for both Celtic and Rangers supporters. Adopt the Villarreal Celtic Submarine pattern. Stop hating each other, and yeah. um, because it's a personal bugbear of mine that I know many Celtic supporters and I know many Rangers supporters and they all hate each other. They hate each other. And one of the most vivid memories I've got is sitting in Villarreal with the second time they came over with 4,000 sitting in this hall in Villarreal and the Celtic supporters stand, started singing at the top of the voices if you hate the F and Rangers mm -hmm. clap your hands. 4,000 have clapped. The 4,000 Spaniards looked at them with blank faces. What the hell yeah. are you on? This is not what we're about. Yeah. But yeah. They, they'll say they don't hate, but sometimes they do. They express it. They don't show love and respect. Mm -hmm. No, that's for sure. They don't show it. <laughs> 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 or feel it. It's quite a subject, of course, right. that would, uh, would merit its own and has merited many programmes and books yeah. and uh, 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 dissection over the years, and we're not going to sort it here. Yeah. Let's get back to Ringwood then. For the future, what's happening this year, Sandy? This year we're having um, two festivals a spring festival and an autumn festival. Uh, the Spring Festival is called Blooming Ringwood 2022 and will run from March till June. It will include uh, five new launches and um, f five events based around existing uh, books linked by the, the themes. Um, like the, the, there'll be a, one event, one we touched on there, that is uh, Glasgow Crime Writing. Um, uh -huh. For, written by those who know for those who care and right. that would be the theme of that okay night. and the other festival? Uh, the uh, the autumn festival and i'm still looking for a better name than autumnal ringwood there's a, a small prize to anybody who submits a better name than that okay i'm on it S season of mist and mellow fruitfulness we've tried playing more of that but nothing i'll get worked. my people on that right get away. them on it small prize might even be a Simon McLean book. Uh, it's a small we've, we've got to get rid of That's quite a big book. I'll hold a big up a good wardrobe. <laughs> but um, that, that will 
uh, equally include uh, the other five uh, books that we're going to launch this year, plus other events, including, for example, w w one theme that, that's recurring through Ringwood is, is what we call the Irish Connection, and that takes me back to the, the sectarianism we've talked mm -hmm. about. I mean, it's a scarring feature of Scottish society. Um, I mean, it, it, it scarred it amazingly from the 1870s to the, the, the 1970s, the, the effect of the um, response to the Irish Catholic immigration into Scotland and the hate it generated and the sectarian rivalry it, it generated. Um, and some of our writers have tapped into it. Two have tapped into it in, in, in one way and two in another. The, and interesting, it gives us a, a Scottish perspective on Irish history. Mm -hmm. One of our, uh, the first books Ringwood published was Torn Edges by Brian McHugh, which is about the Irish Civil War. Now, amazingly, fascinatingly, Ireland hasn't produced a lot of literature about the Civil War, partly because historically the Irish are ashamed of it. Mm -hmm. um, largely because in one year Irishmen killed more Irishmen than the hated oppressors England killed mm. in a hundred years. Was this in the late 19th century? Nin no, 1920. Okay. 1921-22. Um, and uh, Brian's book brings a Glaswegian perspective and a historical perspective to the Civil War. Charlie Sharkey, um, wrote a book called The Volunteer, um, which is, Ringwood certainly claims, uh, one of the best uh, fictional pieces about the Belfast Troubles, the 1960s to 1990s. Mm -hmm. So you, you're you getting a, a Scottish perspective in Irish history. On the Troubles. Yeah. Yeah. But on the other side, uh, one of the, the books that we'll be publishing in Blooming Ringwood is those tyrannising landlords and the folk song lovers, uh, whoever listened to this will know that's a quote from a, an Irish folk song. Sure. But part of what drove a lot of people to leave Ireland and come to Scotland was that the, the landlords, usually absentee English, English, kept up and and up in the rents. And the, the, and the evictions, yeah. The evictions. But a lot came to Scotland. But Amazingly, the, uh, those tyrannising landlords is about one Irish family, first generation Irish family, and all the difficulties and challenges they faced in integrating into Scottish society, Scottish politics, Scottish employment. Mm -hmm. Fascinating book, and it's written by Sean Damer, who anybody knows anything about social policy history in Glasgow is the leading expert in, for example, uh, Glasgow's council house policy for a for mm -hmm. hundred years. Um, but he is claiming, and we've had this claim verified and it's correct, that despite the existence of, of the Irish dimension in Scotland for a long time and references to it in literature, he says this is the first fictional work um, of any magnitude that is devoted to the trials and tribulations of a first generation family. And uh, I mean, others, most of Scottish literature, including books like Doherty, etc., refer to it, but they don't deal with it. Right. Um, so we, we're going to advertise this book as, as, as the first in depth look. A, a first generation Irish family and all the dynamics and tensions of It'll be a fascinating the, launch as well it because be, it brings it's, worldwide it's because good. of the Scots and Irish the, are global, it's global issues. It that should we're be a, about. a massive market for this book. We're launching it in the Oran Moor on the 13th of April. Excellent. Oran Moor is a great venue for yeah. a book launch. Yeah. Um, in the West so, uh, anybody listening to this, put that in your diary, come along, it'll be a fascinating night. Will that be free? Absolutely free. Yeah. It will also be live on Ringwood Facebook, so one right. way or another, put it in your diary and don't miss it. And will the author be there t talking about the book as well? Yes, and some questions, yes. And he, he's, um, he's the kind of guy who likes to be challenged. Right. Um, 
Og rum så. Mås skåret så rum så gidt argument. Ja, det er bedt. Det er bedt. Hvor vi er gidt nægt. I was thinking as you were touching on some of the massive issues that you've just touched on over the last hundred, more than a hundred years of Irish history and Scottish input to that and the, the famine and all the rest of it and all the reasons that these two communities are so integrated. <clears throat> and I thought maybe that explains why Villarreal found it so easy to be welcoming and love and respect. It's the history that's the problem, Sandy, not necessarily the people that are involved. I would suggest. No, well, just specific examples. Or the 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 Villarreal people thought they were getting English hooligans. They, right. they weren't aware of Celtic's background. <coughs> but no, you, they're, they're more wishing they had English uh, hooligans. You, you, <laughs> your more general point is correct, but I mean, I, I mentioned that the hundred years of sectarianism stopped in nineteen seventy, but. Scottish society is still disfigured by ongoing yeah. uh, aftershocks of, of that. Yeah. I mean, the Rangers Celtic rivalry is one, but the, I mean, my, my book, A Subtle Sadness, which is about 100 mm -hmm. years of Scottish identity, shows the ongoing impact on Scottish politics. Yeah. I mean, most Scots. And every aspect of Scottish yeah. life, really. And my book, as you mentioned, The 10% starts when I was born in the, in the late 50s, mm -hmm. early 60s. And it was just a part of life. But I would suggest that that's 50 years. As the generation, because I'm only 50, <laughs> <laughs> uh, over those 60 years, we've made great strides, haven't we? We've made great strides, but we're not a sectarian free society. No, no, for sure. And it, that there's still enough tension and, and um, links between past and present um, effects to, to justify further literature on, on this sure. topic. Yeah, as we become more aware of what's going on. So we've got these two festivals in 2022. How has the, the lockdown affected the industry then? Have you had a boom time during lockdown? Because they say that there's been more books published in the last two years than there were in the last ten. Yeah. It, 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 it's it's quite complicated. Actually, certainly our sales over the last two years have been uh, well, 2020 uh, our sales stayed at the same level. Uh, 2021 they actually uh, increased quite significantly. Um, but there, th there were two main reasons for that. The first one is that uh, previously we had relied on a, a a physical model of launching and, and selling our yeah. books. You like would, the Oran Moore and venues like you that. You would get everybody who mm. knew the author and might buy the book solely yeah. because the author had written it rather than <clears throat> any respect. Because you had to buy it. You get them in a room and you work the moral blackmail, you're not getting out of this room till you buy a book. <clears throat> uh, and you're here <clears throat> this evening in order to honour this book, so buy it. Yeah. But... <laughs> We couldn't do that for over a year and a bit, um, so we had to learn the skills of digital marketing. And interestingly, you get a far bigger audience at a digital launch. You're talking thousands rather mm -hmm. than your, your uh, 50 to 150 of a physical launch. But the downside of it is you can't put moral and physical blackmail on them. Because they, they, yeah. they press a red button and you've lost them. Um, yeah. So we, we didn't actually generate many more sales but it, it got us and our interns uh, generating um, the skills that yeah. could be applied generally to the marketing of books and you, you uh, as I mentioned before have been in the lead of that and this whole exercise of, of podcasts and YouTube channels too is a reflection of our acknowledgement that uh, th these are, are new and uh, good ways to market and sell our own books. Yep, and as CEO of, uh, of Ringwood, <clears throat> talking about this new format, what we're doing here with the interviews, how do you see that developing? What would your vision for that be, Sandy, over the next years? <clears throat> I, 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 I think it's an area of considerable potential which we've hardly 
the targeted. I mean, we, we've proved quite good in uh, uh, launching a book and generating about the same around our, our, our launch. But what we've been less good at is keeping interest going after a launch. But the, your uh, model, where we can feature an author, get them to talk at some length about the book, uh, link it up to videos and other material, and um, maybe get two authors with similar books to bounce things off each other. I, I think that's an open-ended um, field that we're going to be able to, mixing my metaphors, play with great abandon for the next... I, I, I don't see this as just a temporary measure. I think this is... Um, an important new strand for Ringwood uh, for the foreseeable future. Good, and thanks for coming along to help us get it off the ground, Sandy. It's been fascinating. And there's subjects and type headings in there that we could talk about all day. And I know you could anyway. Right. <laughs> and good luck for your team in the, in the coming months. Uh -huh. All the best. Thanks, Sandy. Cheers. Mm -hmm.